There is one piece of knowledge that if you have it, you're going to be able to make the right decision in each one of these three positions. So guys, first thing before we go over the entire game, what would you play as the black pieces in any of these situations? Well, what if I told you that Reddy, from this moment in the game, move number five, already knew that he was going to get this end game and win the game and of course we have talked about this sort of retro analysis before so it is time to reinforce it here we see ready playing knight f6 alekine alekin alienhin uh, variation or defense and after e5 knight d5 knight c3 knight takes c3 we have the first moment where the pawn structure is going to dictate the remaining of the game guys if you were the white pieces would you take with the b pawn or with the D pawn? Well, there are good reasons for both sides. It depends on what kind of player you are. Now, D takes C3 makes sense because you are opening up the bishop. You could develop quicker. You could set up an attack. So maybe develop the bishop, queen D2, castle queen side, and attack, right? Now, maybe you're a little bit more strategic, more positional, and you like the idea of taking with the B pawn because in general, we should be bringing pawns from the edges towards the center. We also talked about how these doubled pawns isolated typically gives you semi-open files. And ultimately, you want to be careful with the pawn priorities that are created if you take with D takes C3. In this game, D takes C3 was played and according to Reddy, when he wrote on his book, he already knew what to do throughout the remaining of the game, of course. Tactics could happen and everything else, but at least we have a plan. We have some guidelines to follow, right? So basically what he wants is pawn to d6. And now regardless of what the white pieces do, he's going to try to keep a pawn majority on the king side. Three pawns versus three. This is going to give you a potential pass pawn in the end game. So with that in mind, if the white pieces don't take me, I'm going to take them. And again, with these two pawns, disappeared we have the pawn majority if they take us like they did well the move that is consistent with that plan is queen takes d6 number one i'm getting ready for that end game so any simplification is going to accentuate that pawn majority right so i want to get to that end game as quickly as possible and then after the queen took if we take with the e pawn then there's no pawn majority anymore three versus three and then four versus four on the queen side instead we take with the c pawn and now I keep my four versus three on the king side. I know it looks too simple. I know that those of you who are not experienced yet, you're gonna be like, yeah, but then I miss a fork or a checkmate. Well, this is assuming you've been with me from the beginning, you already have a good foundation, you're not gonna miss any silly tactics, right? So after C takes D6, the white pieces try to get their bishops set to put pressure on the queen side, trying to create some uh, deficiencies there and get back in the game, right? So nice C6. Bishop e3, black pieces do the fianchetto on the king side, and after bishop g2, castle, knight d4, we get to the second position that I showed you at the beginning. You already know the plan, so forget about taking on d4. We're going to be fixing the pawn structure. You have no advantage anymore. And of course, we cannot let them just get the pawn for free. So the move is as simple as bishop d7. Any trace here, simplification, good for us. And more importantly, again, we leave them with the doubled pawns. And I know that a lot of you might be thinking, okay, but the white pieces also have a pawn majority. But again, since these two are doubled, it looks like they have only three pawns instead of four. So castle, then rook f to c8. This is exactly like we talked on the Sicilian endgame. We had a lesson on it. This is consistent with the plan that we discussed there. Not to mention, guys, only semi-open file we have to occupy that file and i'm setting up a simple tactic which is taking on d4 then taking on c2 my rook is on the seventh rank and even if they take i'm going to have rook b8 and this pawn is going to fall as well so they have to take simplification good for me then rook goes to d1 and again simplification good for me king takes back and now this is a moment that i know for me it is very important because this is something I need to reinforce. I understand all of these concepts, but sometimes I miss moves like the next one. And feel free to pause the video, see if you can come up with it. But the move is actually pawn to b5. Idea to fix the queen side. It, it would be very nice if we could make progress on the king side while my opponent has nothing on the queen side. And also it's very important that you understand the fact that we have 
the polymerity doesn't mean we need to put it in motion soon. If we do it prematurely, we might drop pawns, we might create weaknesses. So this is something that I have for certain. So I'm going to leave it for the end. I want to get to that end game. Then I put it in motion. So after bishop d4, we got a5. Then bishop g7, happy to simplify the game. Rook e1, I'm going to defend the pawn by bringing the king closer. Then rook e4, and here we start to see a very important concept that we talked about in lesson 107, guys. Rooks, ideally, they would be, they would be on a square where they have an open or semi-open file, but also an open or semi-open rank. That's the best they could be, right? So rook e4 meets that criteria from here. This is a pretty um, efficient rook. Then the black pieces do another very nice move that we cannot forget. We talked about this on our latest lesson, this pawn sacrifices to gain a strategic advantage. What's the idea? Well, if you take me, I'm going to enter the seventh rank, chop off everything, right? So it's not like I'm allowing you to get rid of that doubled pawn for free. So c4 was played instead. And now rook to c5, looking for the same concept. Rook on the semi-open file, semi-open rank. This is as efficient as it could be. So b3, double up the rooks, and of course, I'm getting ready to play d5. Another pawn sacrifice to activate my rook to gain some strategic advantage. Now, rook d4, forget about d5 for now, but that allows me to continue to bring the king over. So king e8, rook d5, simplification, it makes sense. Rook c5, let's simplify and look, they play king f3, but if they had simplified, guys, that's it. We got an extra pawn. This is like being up a pawn, right? Three pawns stop the four pawns they have on the on the queen side, and we're going to get a potential pass pawn, like I said before. So instead, king f3, king d7, rook d3, king c6, and after c3, forget about taking the pawn. I don't want him to get rid of that double pawn, and that's it. I want him to take me so that I keep a pawn that stops two. We talked about this on lesson 65, I believe, right? So rook e5, activate that rook, and leave c5 available for the king to replace the rook. So the king takes care of the queen side. The rook, that is such an active piece, is going to try to go after the weak pawns. So c takes before, a takes before, and now you see it even clearer. This pawn doesn't allow this one to advance. We have ampersand, and this one is blocked as well. And then at this point, the white pieces play rook e3, not allowing us to penetrate. But guys, that's it. We simply trade the rooks. And if you already went over our recent lesson on chess improvement, you should know how to win this with your eyes closed. And I don't care how advanced you think you are. This next move that the black pieces played, I'm pretty sure that you are going to miss it if you play fast. So let me know in the comments, guys, if you found this next move or not. Feel free to post the video. But the move is, of course, pawn to d5. And once they take, if they don't take me, I'm going to take them. This is going to be a, an isolated pawn that I'm going to collect. When they took, king takes. And again, one pawn that stops two. And I have a pawn majority on the king side. So I'm going to get a pass pawn. So we have king e2. Active king, always in these end games, I tell you it's about pass pawn or active king. So my king is only four. This is just too good for the black pieces. King d2, e5, f5, get that passed pawn, and end of story, guys. h5, king f2, f3, and the white pieces simply resign. Now, before I let you go, there's one little trick here. In case you don't know it, most of you should know it by now. But let's say they have played something like this. We could do one of two plans. We could go for the one that I wish all of my students went for, which is the safe one. Bring the king over, collect, that's it. But some of my students, they want to be fancy and they choose this one where they go, king f3, put the king in this sort of a smothered situation, forcing the pawn to advance, right? And then you take, push, and then you could even ask for a rook and that is checkmate so there you have it guys notice how this great player from move number five already had an end game in mind is it always going to be like this of course no but the more we learn about these ideas we repeat them they're going to become second nature you're always going to be in your elements regardless of the middle game position you get